Rock music legend Bruce Springsteen is in the theatrical spotlight this new season, opening on Broadway in an intimate solo show. Also headed to Broadway next month, a revival of the 1988 Tony Award-winning play M. Butterfly. November sees the opening of Meteor Shower, written by Steve Martin and starring Amy Schumer. While in Washington, D.C., it's curtain up this fall for Mean Girls at the National Theater with a script written by Tina Fey. Of all the shows opening on Broadway, the most talked about this new season bears the most famous name in wizardry. Mark Phillips in London picks up the tale. So, where were we? When we last saw Harry Potter, it was at the end of the final book and movie, Deathly Hallows, when the boy wizard, now a father, together, was sending his own son, Albus, off to Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. A trip that always began on the magical platform, nine and three quarters. Seven books, eight movies, and about a billion dollars to the good later for its creator, J.K. Rowling. That was supposed to be the end of it. I genuinely, I, I, didn't, I didn't want Harry to go on stage. I um, felt that I was done. So what happened? Harry Potter and the Cursed Child happened, a theatrical collaboration with director John Tiffany and playwright Jack Thorne. Please take your seats. Oh, we are ready to depart 19 years later. It's been the theater event of the year in London. And the award goes to Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. It won a record nine Olivier Awards, Britain's version of the Tonys. And it's about to go to Broadway. Tickets for the New York production, which opens next year, go on sale next month. What is it about the prospect of earning millions of pounds <laughs> from bringing Harry Potter to the stage that most appealed to you? Well, I'd said no to everyone um, for 10 years, because to answer your question equally directly, we all know I don't need the money. Life is too short. I mean, it, it felt right, it felt when... What convinced her, Rowling says, was the prospect of the collaboration with Tiffany and Thorne and the temptation to tell the story of Harry's son, Albus, and the burden he carries as the child of a famous parent. The rest, we sort of can't tell you. Part of the shtick of the Harry Potter production is that anybody who's seen it is asked not to reveal the plot and spoil it for those who haven't. So I'm asking you one more time to keep the secrets. I know we're sitting here under penalty of excommunication if we talk about the plot, but what can you tell us? Anybody, help I'm not taking responsibility. The, the, <laughs> the first scene of our uh, play is the last chapter of Deathly Hallows. Albus, it's kind of suggested very beautifully, isn't going to have as, as, as easy a time. So it's, it's all there for the kind of taking. And they do take their time taking it. The play is actually two plays, five hours of theater split into two parts. Hello. The audience hasn't complained. <laughs> is it possible to give Potter fans too much, or they suck up anything that you lay on to them. Why stop at two performances? Could have gone on for a week, I suppose. Because, <laughs> just because um, she spoke like a mother. Just because <laughs> people want a lot doesn't mean they should have <laughs> everything that they want. We'll just give them what's good for them. Ah, and the magic right. that was so good for them in the books and the computer-generated special effects of the movies. Gryffindor! <laughs> has not been lost on the stage. John's line all the way through it was, you know, the, the, the films have special effects. We have the collective imagination of our audience. So if we can create something that's, uh, that takes them on this journey, um, they will go with us. Has there ever been a point where you felt your, your audience, your public, uh, rebel against what you were doing? I mean, oh, God, even, yeah. You, there has been. Uh, yeah, come on. This is the age of social media. You think I don't get told 
in no uncertain terms that I've done the thing they didn't want to happen to a character or um, why on earth am I taking it into theatre? One is never <laughs> deluded about the fact that some people aren't happy. That's the way it goes. Do you care what the public says? As a writer or any kind of creative person, you actually do have to hold tight to your vision. I have no interest whatsoever in doing certain things that I know would be very popular with the fandom. What, what can I I'm ask I'm not what, even going to go there. What did I there. ask you for? I'm not Come going on. there. I'm not going there. No, I'm not, say, I'm not saying that because my Twitter feed will be a place of hell <laughs> for three months if I say it, so I'm not going to say it. Yeah, it's similar to how I would imagine Hogwarts. We first um, met Joe Rowling in the pre-Twitter world of the late 1990s when the whole Harry Potter thing was just taking off. She was then a single mother, scraping a living as a substitute teacher. So, um, who had an idea one day while riding a train. And I suddenly thought, wizard school. And I, I got so excited about the idea, I, re I really did. But I didn't have a working pen on me, so I just had to sit there for four hours and think. And loads of the characters that appear in the books came to me during that, that train journey. When she did find a pen, the book spilled out onto paper. Increasingly adults have By the time we spoke with no her, her first three books were at the top of bestseller lists on both sides of the Atlantic. I never expected the book to make me money. I was totally realistic about what writing children's books involved, and that involves no um, money, really, at all. Until, that is, Joe Rowling invented Harry Potter. Each successive book set new records as the fastest selling of all time. Harry, the books, the movies, became an industry. Was there a point where you realized my whole life is different than I thought it was going to be? Around about the time I met you, <laughs> I would have, and the two things aren't connected. No. So about 99, it was starting to dawn on me that this wasn't going to go away. I remember thinking, Okay, okay, let's stop, take stock, it's, all, it's okay, we can handle this. And then everything went mad. And the craziness kept on going until the end, or what was supposed to be the end of Harry Potter. Rowling struck out on a new path by writing a series of detective novels under the name of Robert Galbraith. They sold okay until it became known that Robert Galbraith was Joe Rowling. Then they sold a lot better. I wanted to send it out as an unsolicited manuscript and I wanted to get honest feedback. Why? Because, you know, because I'm not stupid. I'm fully aware that I could write a really rubbish detective story and people would probably say, well, you know, it'll probably sell a few copies because it's got her name on it. And that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to really earn it. And uh, so I did. I managed to get an offer from someone who didn't know it was me. They wanted to meet Robert which was fabulous, except I couldn't go to the meeting <laughs> because, <laughs> because I clearly was because, Yeah, because I'm not Robert. Good luck, Harry Potter. But the play has brought her back to Harry Potter, the boy wizard with the scar on his forehead that hurts when trouble is coming, leading to one last magical question. Is this the end of it? Harry's story now, I think, I'm done, I'm done. I. I needed to be persuaded to do 19 years on. Um, and I'm really glad I was pers persuaded because I'm so proud of this play. But no, we're not going to see Albus's son go to Hogwarts. Well, not on my watch. In 100 years time, I'll come back and haunt the person who does it. <laughs>